Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the British Property Federation's webinar for better or for worse, marrying risk and resilience in real estate, uh, an event that forms part of my BPF digital series. My name is Steve Panton, a partner in the Womble Bond Dickinson's regulatory team, and I'm delighted to have been asked by the uh, BPF to chair this webinar, which will focus on risk management. As you're all already acutely aware, there are a current number of significant operational risks affecting property, some long-standing but growing in prominence, and others that, in the eyes of some, have arisen in more recent years, including the continuing impact of the pandemic, premises safety, particularly that of fire safety, sustainability, and reputational risk, to name but a few. Insurance may be an answer to some of those, but another is planning for greater resilience through risk management to minimize your organization's liabilities, both corporate and individual. Over the course of the next 20 minutes, our panel, which I'll introduce in a moment, will provide you with their insight and perspective on how property related risks are affecting your business or your clients and how these have managed. So to introduce the panel, we have Eloise Francis, Head of Operational Risk, Legal and General Capital, will provide an overview of LNG's operate, uh, approach to risk. Jules Duncan, board director at the BCG. Jules will explain the risks high on the agenda for uh, their clients and how he is helping clients to manage those risks, from, particularly from a reputational perspective. We have Sharon Brown, director, real estate risk compliance and insurance at Federated Hermes, who will highlight some of the key risks affecting Federated Hermes and how these are being controlled, and also Graeme Sibley, Senior Sector Lead, Alternative Residential at the NHBC. Graeme will focus on the work of the NHBC and how they can help design out some of those risks and help mitigate risks through its products and services. After we've heard from uh, Eloise, Jules, Sharon and Graeme, we'll take questions. We should have about 20 to 30 minutes to do so. So please do use the opportunity to uh, go ahead and ask those questions and also share your own insights. Two final points, if I may. Firstly, for the purposes of Q&A, if you could please use the Q&A function rather than chat function. And secondly, just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded. I'm sure that uh, Ian Fletcher or uh, one of his colleagues uh, will be able to confirm when that recording will be available. So thank you everyone and over to you Eloise please. Thank you Stephen. Welcome everybody and thank you for, for joining this morning. Nice sunny morning down here in Sussex and I hope that the weather is, is fair for you, you as well at home. Risk management. I think most of you probably are familiar with LNG um, as not just an insurer but also a fund manager uh, managing UK pension funds uh, across across the, the country and investing a lot of that in property and our Elgin Real Assets team uh, of which I think a few of my colleagues are on the call today are probably the, one of the UK's leading um, teams that invest in property. So as, as an insurer, as a, a fund manager, as an investor, we have to have by, by our regulators in the financial services sector, quite strong and robust approach to risk management. Um, and that is across all of our operations, all of our interests, all of our investments. Um, and it is a, a very strong uh, framework that we have internally around risk management and it goes top to bottom across everything that we do and uh, you know across all of our subsidiary businesses and operations and in LGC legal and general capital we have house builders we have uh, retirement village operators we have a modular homes business and all of those are expected to follow suit when it comes to robust risk management so we we coin it enterprise risk management and enterprise risk management in effect is the framework by which an organization manages risk um, and if you think um, a, about your your organization or the division that you work in or the, the the property portfolio that you manage or the project that you might be managing uh, you you will have a strategy or a goal or a vision and that's in effect your your compass that 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 aim that you're you're working to your strategy is in fact in, in effect that the, the point on that compass where where you're you're working towards and you will have a, a route map or a, a variety of milestones or a program of activities to get to that um that that strategy or that goal whether that be at your divisional level or at a corporate level 
in order for that to be successful, in order for you to get to your, your goal or your strategy or your vision, um, you need to manage risk. You need to understand what those risks are, manage them appropriately to ensure that you can be successful in your aims and goals. So that's your compass, so managing risk around your compass. The other thing that you need to, to, to have, and this sounds like a little bit of a, 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 a trek, if you like, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a holiday, but you, you need a radar. And that radar is, is assessing what's coming in externally by way of risk. So what are the emerging risks? What's happening externally in the industry, in, in, in the country, globally? Um, how will that impact me? And what does that mean for risk for me and my organisation or my project or my property? And that radar is really important as well. So you need your compass to, to, to know where you're going and manage the risks along that route and your radar to look at those, those emerging risks and have that horizon scanning aspect. So I'm not gonna do, dwell too much more on this, but in, in the property and construction sector at the moment, there, there, there are a huge amount of things happening that can create risk for your business or your property or your portfolio. Um, we've got economic and business environment risks. You know, UK recession in and out potentially over the next year or so. We've got um, changing consumer demand, which is, is the pandemic has, has, has created a huge shift there, whether it be retail, home working. We don't quite know how that's going to play out. Uh, we've got things like digitization, big data, internet of things. These are all things that can have impacts on your business. So what are the risks to you? And that's in the economy and the business environment. We've got geopolitical and social environment change. Climate change is a huge thing. Uh, everybody's striving for their net zero targets. What are the risks around that, those transitional risks that you have to go through as an organisation or with your properties? Um, we've got Brexit fallout still um, around people, products, trade and the legislation around that. And we've got social movements out there as well, like Black uh, Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, which we don't hear so much of these days, but it's still there. And the diversity challenges uh, that we face as an industry. So th that geopolitical and social environment um, area, again, is very important for us when, when we're managing property, but also as our organisation. Then we've got specifics to the sector in the industry that we work in, supply chain disruption um, as a big thing, um, counterparty failure as well, um, risk failure around, but project risk failure around some of our construction schemes that might be going on, massive skills uh, and labour shortages in the industry. And will we see an uptick in modern slavery as a result of, of what's gone on over this last year or so? Um, so that's our sector and our industry. And then when we jump into the legislative and the regulatory change, well, we've got the building safety bill, fire safety bill, we've got planning reforms, leasehold reforms, again, changes to climate and environmental legislation, potentially new competence requirements in our industry. That creates a huge amount of risk to any organisation that's involved in the construction and property sector at the moment. How do we navigate those changes to mitigate impacts to our strategy and goals? So I just wanted to set the scene there around what some of those core risks are and the reasons for enterprise risk management being so important. It's about that communication, that conversation in your business. It's about ensuring risk knowledge and understanding and management flows upwards, downwards and across all, all parts of your business because it's useful information. And how does how do your boards, either of your portfolios or your divisions or ultimately the, the top co, how do they understand and, and know about and can support the business around risk management? So I'm going to pass over now to Jules, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, risk and what he's seeing with his clients. And, and Jules is from BECG. Eloise, thank you so much. Um, that was great stuff. And I, I, I like your analogy um, around the compass and the radar. And um, for those that don't know, BECG is a, a communications consultancy that advise clients across the built environment. Uh, we're advising on political, economic, um, and other risks and how that impacts on reputation um, and how you work with reputation to, to find the opportunities in these risks and challenges um, rather than a problem. So we are very much part of the radar system, um, but also the team that then provides the tools and the programs to engage with all stakeholders to make sure 
that these um, any obstacles are successfully navigated. So just for my introduction, I want to spend a few minutes just sharing with you how um, corporate risks are moving around on the risk registers that we develop with our clients. Obviously, things are always prioritizing up and down. So I just wanted to reflect on what's at the top of those risk registers, if you like, and some of the things that we um, have been working on to help build resilience and mitigate those risks and navigate through them. Um, before we sort of dive in um, to the sector, I think it's instructive to just zoom out a little bit and take a wider view um, on the way that reputational risk is being considered across the corporate world currently. Um, and it won't be any surprise to you to, to say that, you know, the three letters you can't get away from at the moment are ESG um, and how just about any organisation is being challenged to perform in the context of environmental, social and governance performance. As we all know, this is you know, driven from the investor perspective, but it's actually become a framework around a huge amount of corporate planning and business planning. Um, and it's wise to actually use as a, as a framework, um, I think, in risk management today. And it just gives a little framework for some of the prioritization that we can talk through. So let's start with the E, um, environmental. Um, and as Eloise mentioned just a minute ago, you, you, you cannot avoid the political context and the political will around this. You know, Joe Biden is rallying world leaders today, including China and Russia. He's going to set a new carbon reduction target, which is more ambitious for the US. And he'll be pushing his guests to do the same. The UK will host the COP26 event in Glasgow in November, um, where further challenges will be laid down. And these net zero targets will be put in place. And what's interesting for us at the moment, looking at this issue, is that the targets are there, but the action that needs to happen at a corporate, societal and individual level to meet them is absolutely enormous. And for this sector, you know, you cannot underestimate the scale of this challenge. It, it probably is number one, and it's probably just kind of getting back to the top and pushing building safety out of the way, which I'll come back to later, that's been at number one for a lot of the past year. Because if you're looking at what the United Nations Environment Program says, 38% of global carbon emissions are down to the buildings sector. So that's across real estate and infrastructure but 38%, so you're right in the eye of this. Shareholders, partners, funders, everyone is focused on how are you, how are our clients stacking up their environmental strategies? So what are we challenging people with? And we're, we're, we're going into organizations and saying to them, you know, you've got to get it into the board agenda. You've got, if you don't have it already, what is our clear strategy around moving to net zero and decarbonization? And how are we telling that story clearly? How can we prioritize that in everything that we do? And remember that it isn't just about the performance of the building or existing portfolios. The challenge is going to be for the entire construction life cycle from sourcing materials through to the whole life of the building. And that's going to take a huge amount of work. So we're advising clients on that. We're trying to set that in the context of the government's green economic recovery agenda. And we'd also recommend that you do work collaboratively here. Um, obviously, good trade bodies like the BPF and others are leading in this area. And it's a huge challenge, so you should operate together where possible. Um, and I think just you know, with, um, with Graham here as well, from sort of the house builder side of things, from the commercial property sector, you have an advantage that you can look into how the house builders are going to deal with the future home standard. Um, They've been asked to act first with a 75% reduction in carbon emissions compared to 2013 building regulations and get that in place by 2025. No time away at all. Um, it's a huge challenge. It's everything. It's energy efficiency, ventilation, the materials, the footprint, the biodiversity, the whole thing. And, and I think the, the commercial sector has an opportunity to look in and see that. Um, but there's a consultation out there at the moment, the future building standard, um, or it just closed a few days ago uh, from government. So it's on its way for the wider sector. So preparation is key. So environment is huge. Um, moving on to S um, and social, um, social value 
is becoming more and more important. It's a big risk for every organization to manage. Again, I think Eloise touched on this. It's the power of the socially conscious consumer and the fact that they demand that organizations don't operate only for profit, but also for purpose and for good. Now in this sector, you, the power is here for actors in, in property and real estate and their funders to revitalize whole communities and transform places through regeneration. And the expectation is that, that this sector will again step up and provide job creation, enhanced life chances, greater education chances, community cohesion, better places, and that that will happen through the course of the work to have that's going um, through the projects that are being built. Uh, and it's not a nice to have public procurement in particular are going to be scoring on social value when they're putting contracts through. So how good are you again at this? You know, can you grasp it as an opportunity, not as a as a challenge? Are you measuring the social value in a sophisticated way that your organizations contribute? And can you track that over time? It's a huge opportunity if you get it right. And just lastly, um, let, let's jump into governance. And um, this is clearly the, 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 the part around robustness and quality of your internal structures and practices, your checks and balances to ensure those ethical practices throughout your business and also into supply chains accountability and transparency. Um, I'll just put the huge topic into this, which is building safety. Um, and this it has been number one, pro number one risk on a lot of um, our clients risk registers since Grenfell in 2017. And it's not going away primarily because of that legislation that Eloise mentioned. Whilst the fire safety bill is getting close to being passed, it's just one piece of then the wider legislation to set up a new regime of building safety um, control. And that's going to take from our intelligence, maybe one to two years to go through Parliament. And at the whole time, the high octane debate of who should pay, who should be accountable for failures of the past um, is, is making this a heightened issue that can really damage your reputation. Um, and if you can get it right, then obviously you can come through as one of the winners in this, um, or at least a less bad actor. It really is a tough one for reputation. So some facets that we're advising clients on, you need to look at that, um, the, the governance, how good were your processes and systems historically? What are you looking at in terms of your portfolio risk on fire safety? Most people have done that, but do bear in mind, it is not just cladding and it is not just tall buildings. We're talking about any multi-occupancy building with a few stories and basic construction like compartmentation. So this can go very, very broad. Um, what are you look, looking like on your actions to make building safety in the past? And are you getting ready for the new building safety regulatory world, which will be obviously policed through the health and safety executive and the requirements you'll have for accountable persons and a golden thread of building safety information. Um, here, um, it's a very busy area. Um, it's about understanding all those risks and trying to see them before they're outed for you through a campaigning group or through the media. And it's then about having enough resource really to respond to it. And we've seen quite a number of clients build up specific fire safety teams and building safety teams to deal with the immediate risk and also to be ready for what is to come. Um, so I just quick canter through um, a few highlights that we're seeing in the risk and reputation area at the moment. Uh, there are more and I'd be really happy to take questions at the end. And now we're going to move on um, and hand over to Sharon. Thanks, Jules, for that. What I've been asked to sort of talk about is how, how we're actually looking at re risks in real estate and in development real estate within, within Federated Hermes. So really on a, an actual physical operational implementation in, a, in, a, in, a, in an operational context. So looking at the operational challenges at the moment, um, you can't avoid the fact that you've, uh, we, we've been through a year of, of COVID pandemic um, so what that's highlighted, I think, is, is, is how we occupy our offices and how that might then be impacted and what the risks are following up from that. So there's the impact of the reduced occupational requirements, which could be in demand for office space in the future, which will impact on income for clients. But also then there's a risk on how it impacts on systems and how they function, because um, our offices have been designed for high occupancy um, and now the systems that are in place may not function properly. So you have a risk there from the actual um, operation of the building and how that might go, be going forward. 
there's been a lot of talk about the structural factors and the structural risks that we now facing in real estate, things like cladding, like insulation, like fire, fire risks. Um, we all remember Grenfell. I don't think that's something any of us are ever going to forget. Um, and we are still learning from that disaster, you know, what we what we need to have within our buildings and what we need to understand. And with the ever changing regulation, you know, we need to be absolutely on the top of our game in real estate to, to make sure that we are building and we are refurbishing and we are managing our buildings to the best of our ability to make them safe and secure for the people who occupy them. You're looking at um, cyber risk, you know, what with smart buildings are being on the uptake, what do we need to be thinking about in that? Are the smart buildings as safe as they seem to be? Can, are they subject to sabotage? What could be the potential impact for, for occupants and also for the clients on that? Back again to pandemic and then notifiable disease, particularly in the insurance market. I think that the hardening of the insurance market has been a direct um, impact from the, from the pandemic. And Notifiable disease, how does that now function in our insurance premiums and in our insurance placements? So you need to think about that. But the stakeholder engagement and the supply chain issues, I mean, they've both been touched on already, and, and, and changing regulations and how we respond to take our stakeholders with us, whether that be clients or occupational uh, tenants, understanding why we need to make changes within the building so that it's safe, but without impacting on their ability to enjoy the building while they're there. So, what are the really important risk mitigation and resilience elements to it all um, and I think there's a there's a number of sections on this where we need to focus so you have climate change climate change is is real it's there we all know about that how it impacts on real estate is in a number of ways and one of which is floods now we've all been well I think most of us have been subject to a, a, a prolonged sunny periods recently I mean certainly here in, uh, in Welsh Wales, we, we, we've had an unprecedented amount of sun and having grown up here and, and, and known that it's a reputation for a lot of rain, um, it's, it's incredibly dry here at the moment. But in the winter, we had a lot of, lot of rain and much, many of our fields were under flood. So this climate change is making a real impact on, on the, the, the way that the weather uh, is impacting our ability to use our buildings and our, our areas and flood resilience is something we really need to be looking at. How do we prepare our buildings? How do we make our, sure our buildings are, are, are protected against flood, but also in the communities and the areas around us? You know, it's all very well having a flood resilient building if you're if you if your occupiers have to row a boat to get to them because the rest of the community is underwater. So you, there's a little bit of a stakeholder engagement piece to be thinking about there as well. Following on from climate change and net zero, net zero is the big buzz at the moment. Um, it's how you, you reduce your carbon emissions to make sure that you're not adversely impacting climate any more than, than, than we are already. So you're about future proofing your buildings. And then there's a the regulation reputationally, reputational impacts of not achieving net zero. If you go out and make a statement such as um, the, the government has recently made about the 2035 dates and reducing um, carbon emissions into the environment. You know, what are the reputational imp uh, implications and risks on that? If you don't achieve that, you need to be very, very careful what you can achieve, how you can achieve it, and also demonstrating that you really are doing it not that just you're, 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 you're talking the talk, you're actually walking the walk, you're making the changes to reduce, reduce the, the carbon and reduce the risk. There's been a lot of talk about the regulatory fire changes, um, particularly in a residential or occupational premises such as hotels. So if you've got residential buildings in your portfolio, or you have hotels or care homes or uh, other areas where you have 24 hour sleeping accommodation, you really need to be understanding what, what the regulatory changes are, what you need to be putting in place now to make sure that the buildings that you are managing on behalf of your clients um, aren't falling, falling short of the law. Um, and you don't want to be you know, working to, to just as much as you need to. So building control, just, just because you meet building control doesn't mean that's where you stop. What else do you need to do? What can you do over and above what is required of you to make your buildings the place that people want to go to? Because at the end of the day, you know, as, as managers, you're, you're in it to, to, to make money for your clients. That's basically what you're there to do. You take the rents in and you want the best occupiers and the most secure occupation that you can for, for your buildings, because that's how buildings stay safe. 
uh, an unoccupied building you know is not as safe as an occupied building because you spend you, you spend more time you see more things and, and you use it as it's meant to be as it's meant to be used understand and so you need to understand the potential risks really to help you avoid it and that's all about that's what resilience is all about it's all about risk mitigation work it's about understanding your portfolio understanding the regulation around it and understanding what, who who else is out there that can help you to achieve it because you know no man is an island uh, or no person is an island if i'm being correct there and um you need you need to, to, to reach out and to to work with the best people that you can to achieve what you need to do. So what are we doing at Federated Hermes to manage this to risk? Firstly, and most importantly, we're looking to understand the risks and challenges that we have on our portfolio and how they might impact them. So whether that be commercial, whether it may, may be in our residential developments that we're doing at the moment, we're working very, very closely with um, competent individuals who understand the regulation and we are building to the absolute best of our, our ability to do so, looking at what structures we put in place. And that also means working with, with insurers and other professionals out there. We, we want to look at things like uh, CLT and other sustainable products in our buildings, but we understand the risks and the challenges out there, particularly in the insurance market, where this is, is technically an untested uh, product. Um, so we know from a net zero perspective, which we know is one of our risks, that we should be looking at sustainable materials, but we also need to understand um, you know, what, what needs to be done to make sure that they're safe. Do they become structurally unsound if they burn? Do they just char, as the manufacturers say? Um, you know, what would be the potential damage from, from the water? Because as we all know, and any of us who have experienced a, a large loss fire, know that a large percentage of the damage is caused by the water used to put it out. So if you have you know, a large a timber frame building, what's the potential for rot? So you, you keep working down this and you're looking almost like a risk register of, of, of and checklist of what the potential risks are if this happened, what if that, what if this, it's all a what if situation. And then assessing, you know, if that happened, what is the severity of it? The basic tenants of risk assessment, that's all you're looking at. So we're working with specialist partners. So on our flood resilience, we're looking at, we're doing a flood resilience uh, report for our entire portfolio that are in flood zones two and three to start with. We've been supported by insurers on that. And we've been, we're working with experts in how to assess flood resilience and what we need to do in those buildings to make them safe. And also in our developments, um, Federated Hermes, um, as a, as a, a, a plan of action for um, stakeholder engagement and for creating communities. We have a number of large developments in Birmingham, in Manchester, in Leeds, where we've gone out to make places. It's, it's a placemaking scheme. So when we are encouraging people in there, you need to understand if it's in a flood zone risk. So Leeds, for example, um, does have a, a, a a flood risk it's, it's very high in the environment agency ratings in the three three zone so working with the environment agency on flood resilience up and down the river is another way of, of, of dealing with your challenges around risk though and using things like Briam in use um, structures to help build holistic action plans for property risk and resilience so using a formulation that can help you de deliver a holistic uh, approach to risk across your whole building and across your portfolio and I've already mentioned working with our insurers to better manage asset protection requirements and finding agreed risk mitigation activities where there is evidence of increases to the loss potential. So reducing your loss ratio on the estates can, can you know, really help you with your insurers to say, look, we are doing our best, we are reducing our risks. And in this hardening market that we find ourselves at the moment, because of all the pressures on the insurance piece, then... Um, I think that is a good way of, of working with, uh, to manage your risk as well. So I think all the stuff that's been, been spoken about at LOEs and by Jill so far around what the potential risks are, you need to pull it all into a plan of action, identify what's in your portfolio, and then actually prioritise what you need to do and who you need to work with and, and get the help that you need to do that. Um, so from a federated terminus perspective, we are very much about risk mitigation, predicting, analyzing, trying to understand what might be the risks that we might see in order to put prevention in place, because prevention is better than cure 
in any form of risk. And if you can do what you can to prevent it, then you, you're much, you know, you're in a much better position. I hope that's covered what um, you want me to cover in that um, and how it can be actually physically applied to an operational portfolio. Um, happy to answer any questions on anything I've said there and how we might be challenging that. But now I'll pass on to Graham um, to, to finish, a, finish our piece of talking. Thank you very much, Sharon, and, uh, and to the previous speakers, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so some really good points already picked up there, some of which I will um, be able to build out on, actually. Uh, just as an introduction, um, you may or know, may or know, no, not know of NHBC, but pro probably you know, you know is most of it is an insurer, primarily for residential homes, um, but and then also associated with commercial space. Um, we are primarily known for warranty on new homes for private sale, but um, we have um, around around thirty five percent of the policies we write um, are, and that, that proportion is increasing, are for the residential rental market. Be that for people to rent investors and operators. Um, and increasingly for retirement living and affordable housing as well. So I'm going to pick up on some of the main areas um, of risk, particularly in development and construction of new property. And the, the, a lot of the points that have been mentioned before really resonate in terms of risk identification, mitigation in the long term. Um, so NHBC is um, PRA and FCA regulated. As I say, we are an insurer. So we have to have extremely robust risk management um, in place and uh, to uh, maintain a position of um, solvency ratios, because uh, as an insurer, we underwrite um, policies directly ourselves, um, we, we, um, that we base um, all of our decisions on risk um, as perceived, um, and I'll go through some of the risk, uh, risk areas which we cover. And we manage, and we have to manage the risk that we take onto our books, that's to, to, to maintain our, our, and protect our own possession position, but also very importantly, to protect the assets of, the, of, our, of, our, of our policy holders. And in case of investors and, and landlords and operators, to protect their income streams in the effect of defect. So everything that we take onto that book is, is, is assessed on relative risk uh, using uh, the 80 years of technical experience um, and claims experience and what we've seen on site um, um, and what, it, what has gone wrong in the past. A couple of points you, that I heard there talked about, for example, um, cross-laminated timber, um, and it's and, and some of the and some of the issues we've seen in the past with 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 CLT and other timber products, really do inform the way we look at um, design and uh, of buildings, which use those those materials. But the, the process we we go through starts very very early, if you like, um, going right back to looking at looking at the quality of the land, particularly brownfield and former industrial sites. Um, with geotechnical assessments, remediation um, um, works, um, and mitigating factors to to ensure that those that, that that land is suitable to build to, and safe to build on, particularly for residential development. Um, the, the the environment in which the the building is is placed, uh, particularly on high rise, um, in, in its in its a proximity to the sea, to 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 waterfronts, to wind wind blown rain, etc that all has an impact on the design and the construction of a building and we're looking and we look very closely at that, how that works. In, in high-rise developments um, every building is unique. Architects bring their own stamps, operators are seeking defining features um, and, and effectively every building becomes a prototype and with that prototyping comes risk. It's important to focus on the detailing of the design particularly facades, interfaces, balconies, blue roofs uh, etc um, to make sure um, that everything, every aspect of that is designed and built to the to, to the best specification to ensure we don't we minimise the risk of water ingress, for example. Um, apparently, on a, on a slightly more mundane a mundane note, um, we look at basements and basements uh, construction are often viewed as not needing such um, um, high technical uh, specifications, even if it's for a car park. But um, we had an example where long-term water ingress led to stalactite growth um, and uh, in a very expensive residential development, um, uh, stalactite actually fell off and quite, quite severely, severely damaged a very expensive Maserati car. Um, so is, is, is the right tanking in place um, and that needs to be assessed as well. Materials, um, how suitable are they for use um, for the purpose that they're being used for? Will they have the performance and the durability? 
to, to stand li um, life in use of at least 60 years, for example. Um, and that's the specification which we, we, we set on any, any development. And that particularly is important for relate in relation to fire. Um, we've had a few comments there on fire safety in particular, um, but materials need to be independently certified um, and the whole fire strategy needs to be um, assessed. That's fire stopping, carpal compartmentation, means of escape. These are all factors to, to, to review um, in the design of a building well before it gets to construction. And also in use of con uh, innovative construction methods, <clears throat> we're looking for consistent quality and um, out of the factory output and um, the, the completion of the finished home. We work very closely, for example, with um, the company that Eloise uh, mentioned, LNG Modular, um, and, their, and their modular product, um, which is now certified by NHBC. Another risk which we see is the capability of the contractor. Can they deliver to the specification you're looking for? Um, have they got the experience? Have they got the right skill sets? Import, even more importantly, have they got the right financial strength and capacity um, to, to deliver? And it's an area of risk which we see increasingly uh, important for, um, um, for, for, for um, developers and, and, and investors. Can that contractor stand the test of time? Will they be able to finish things through? Are they overstretching themselves? These are all things that need to be reviewed in due diligence. And working with contractors, it's really important to have early, early engagement to ensure that there's confirmed specification um, and avoiding the risk of potential um, tensions, conflicts on, on site when we're getting into, into the development. And also to ensure that they are built into specification. <clears throat> One of the challenges with, with contracting can be the potential for value engineering to reduce costs and the impact that they can have um, on the overall quality of the finished product um, and potentially giving um, issues on the performance of that product. These are all things which NHBC um, engages with um, investors and their development teams and their architectural teams very early or effectively embedding NHBC into their uh, design team to, to uh, right from the earliest possible uh, time. That early engagement is really important. So I think um, a couple of key points I'd, I'd like to emphasize in conclusion. Number one, um, the importance of your own due diligence of the supply chain, um, right from uh, the land that you're acquiring or building on through the contractors you're using and the capabilities they have. <clears throat> um, the need for early engagement with, with um, structural defect insurance providers to, to sort of identify and mitigate the risks that are, that are seen. And finally, to put in place the right insurance that should the worst happen and there's a defect that um, and there's a defect it, um, to ensure that it doesn't impact the assets or the income streams um, too much. So that's what NHBC is working with the market for uh, to put on in, to effectively have long-term asset protection. That was me for now, and um, I'll hand back to Stephen. Great, thanks ever so much, Graham, and to the rest of the panel. Some uh, really interesting and some very common themes there. Uh, just picking out some of those, the importance uh, and growing importance uh, of having the right governance structure in place. Uh, that's something we're very much seeing uh, at WBD, uh, that focus on uh, individual decision making, individual liability and, and board accountability and that of uh, senior management, uh, as well as the importance uh, and that old Achilles heel of uh, supply chain and contractor management and the importance of due diligence and that, that joined up approach um, right really from the start and some of those other uh, emerging uh, and growing uh, risk areas of, of uh, social value and uh, the uh, multifaceted approach that's uh, now increasingly being taken in relation to sustainability issues. Uh, so thank you uh, everyone uh, for your contributions. Um, if we just move on to some of the questions that have come through um, and uh, I'll spread these around the, the panel as best I can. Firstly, um, how have risks shifted uh, over the last 12 months or so during the pandemic? Uh, Eloise, would you mind just giving us your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I'll give one initial observation actually. So as, as someone that's uh, has, has been working in the world of health and safety and, and, and risk management for, for most of my career. Um, I think 
one one observation I have noticed is the role of the health and safety director or practitioner in businesses has suddenly really come to the fore. Um, their, their role around risk management and their skill set in risk management has really come to the fore. I'm not talking about me personally here, um, but that 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 change in understanding it suddenly so I think for a lot of businesses suddenly crystallised the importance of risk management and, and why it is so important. I mean, I I I I I I'm sort of a little bit hesitant to say, but I think COVID we could have had a much worse pandemic. We could have had a, a, a much worse virus, and I think most people recognise that now. Um, but it, what it's allowed businesses to do is really look at how they manage risk. And COVID itself is is not the risk. It's it what it throws at us as a result of the pandemic is the risk to us and our business. It's the, the risk to our sales, perhaps our, our programmes of work, the risk to our workforce, the risk to our customers. It's it's how it impacts other other areas of, of what we do and I think that that understanding and that interplay between risk is so important so I talked a little bit earlier about modern slavery um, we, we most of us will have a modern slavery in our supply chain at some point and I think it's naive to say you don't the, the, obviously the onus is on on every business to look into their supply chain to try and find that um, but we've got changes in the labour pool market in the UK with, with Brexit. Obviously, we've, we've got growing unemployment um, and with that becomes the increase in vulnerable people in the UK. They're, they're great prey for the, the, the labour gangs that, that prey on those vulnerable communities and vulnerable people to put them into modern slavery. So, uh, you know, the, the, the whole change in, in the market around labour as a result of the pandemic as a result of Brexit, as a result of other things and the skill shortage that we're seeing, will will play in the hands of those those labour gangs and we'll see an increase in modern slavery, almost certainly. So it's understanding the interplay between those risks. It's um, knowing if one risk triggers how it will affect the other risks on your enterprise risk register. Um, and it's having that open and honest conversation. And as I think it was Sharon that mentioned earlier, this is not about just you as an individual, this is about talking with industry as we're doing here, talking to our peers, talking to our supply supply chain, talking to the experts out there to really understand what those risks are to your organisation, your property portfolio, your projects, your change programmes. Um, and, and it's yeah, keeping that conversation and that dialogue going around it. That's great. Thank you, uh, Eloise. Sharon, have you had uh, anything to add uh, your insight as to uh, risk shifting during the pandemic? No, I think Eloise is right, but I think what has it has seen is that everybody has had to, in some way, become their own risk manager. Um, and so I think it's 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 shifted, dare I say, the, 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 the thought that sometimes a health and safety manager is there sometimes just to make things awkward. Um, people have realised, actually, the benefits of of preparation, of being prepared for potential risks. Well, you know, we've all learned about, you know, space, about washing your hands, about, and it's all about prevention, you know, preventing yourself from catching anything nasty. So, and I, so I think in people's consciousness now, there is much more um, knowledge of what risk management and risk mitigation is about. Um, and I think it, in some ways as well, it's also demonstrated how resilient we can be because we've all been suddenly forced to work from our homes. We've all had to make changes. Our families have had to make changes. Our colleagues have had to make changes. And just the fact that we're running these sorts of uh, webinars now, and, and it's, it's virtually second nature to us. I mean, if you think back a year ago when we were doing these, we were all, you know, forgetting we were on mute and, you know, all, you know, all sorts of things that we were still trying to get to, 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 to grips with, but we've developed and we've learned. And so, trying to take the positives from an awful situation I think is something we should all take pride in um, you know how we've pulled through to you know to, through this this pandemic and how we've adapted our businesses and adapted our ways of working now each individual has done that as well so um, I think that that's that's a, a great learning from the COVID pandemic. That's great thank you Sharon. Uh, Graham from the NHPC's perspective I, I think the uh, the impact has, has, has spread across into um, the impact on insurance markets um, in, in particular. Um, we've, we've seen um, a, a general harden, hardening of, of insurance markets and um, I'm sure there may be other questions on this as well. And that's had an, had an impact 
um, on, uh, for example, um, the, the ability for, for professional indemnity insurance. PI insurance has become very, very difficult to, 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 to acquire. Um, contract for insolvency, I mentioned before, um, as, uh, in, in, my, in my opening comments, was, was an area where we um, are finding it increasingly difficult to, to, to place that, that sort of cover now. Um, and that's, that's potentially giving um, uh, developers um, and investors a, a challenge in terms of finding, uh, of, of protecting themselves on that, on that area. We are still offering it, by the way, um, but, it's, um, but the pricing has, as, as you can imagine, increased as the risks of it are, are, are massively increasing. Um, so uh, those are sort of some, of the, some of the key impacts we, we found um, post, uh, post, uh, post and during COVID. Great. Thanks, Graham. And uh, Jules? Yeah, thanks, Steve. I think just quickly, just building on something that Sharon said around, you know, resilience of teams and it's the role of any organisation. It's not just this sector um, as a good employer. And I think what the pandemic has done is thrown into sharp relief. Just how do you look after your people? Uh, what's your well-being strategy? And, and as people get back into the workplace or we move to hybrid ways of working um, on that social risk, uh, social part of the risk register, um, there will be a, a spotlight on how are you doing that? Are you doing it well? And have you learned from the pandemic and taking forward, hopefully, some of the good practice you had to help teams to be successful during it? That's great. Thanks, Jules. Uh, question for Graham. What, in your experience of, sorry, um, what uh, is your experience of successful cladding remediation claims under the uh, NHBC warranty? Uh, and the cost to value ratio. Um, I can certainly comment on on, on how we're seeing claims in, in this area. Let's, let's be clear what 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 uh, the, the the cover of, uh, that NHBC provide for is 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 is, is effectively um, if there's um, a, an impact on safety or the um, the quality of the building um, and um, um, as effect um, impacted by. Um, ineffective or, or insufficient quality of build uh, to technical requirements or the original specification. Um, and there have been cases where we have got, um, when, when the um, cladding has been removed, um, then there has, that is exposed um, poor workmanship, um, uh, poor fire stopping, for example, um, within the building. Um, they're, they're, in those cases, um, as you can imagine, we've had, we've reviewed a lot of potential claims. It's those types of cases where there is a, 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 an impact and, and potentially a, a, a cause for claim. And we have settled some very significant claims um, over the last couple of years. Thank you, Graeme. Just uh, picking up on uh, an earlier point, um, working patterns have changed uh, through the course of the pandemic. Um, but we're seeing a um, increasing focus on the importance of managing uh, employee welfare and particularly uh, employee uh, fatigue and worker fatigue. Uh, Eloise, have you uh, seen any uh, difference of approach or particularly the way you or others manage uh, the issue of worker fatigue? Oh gosh, that's, that's such such a, a, a difficult one and it's obviously a, a, a really big topic I think I, I think legal and general won't be the only organization that has invested huge amounts in um, employee well-being over the last uh, year um, in particular um, I think a lot of employers were getting into that space anyway but um, that the pandemic has, has sped up the the level of work um, and support that's that's offered to employees. Um, fatigue is is a, a a real one, and it's quite I think quite a unique one actually in this this virtual world. I think um, just for someone who's who's not escaped this room from a work perspective for a year, it's quite hard. And I was used to being on site, going around seeing our businesses, in and out the office, commuting to London, four hour you know out of my day every day commuting. And it's it, that that change is actually quite difficult. And even our holidays are not really holidays, are they? They're still at home in the home environment, or have been recently. So, worker fatigue, I think, is a, is a really difficult one for employers. I think we've got to make sure our staff take those breaks um, and don't keep rolling their holidays on because it's really important to have that downturn, downtime. Sorry, um, but I think also as as a, an organisation that has construction work 
going on and um, you know you you you're, you've got a huge supply chain there of consultants fatigue with fatigue comes um, mistakes um, and so it's been very aware of, of where those mistakes could creep in as an employer of both your own people but also an employer of of, um, of, of consultants and contractors and that and that's not easy either but again I, I think it, as I said earlier it goes back to conversation and communication having the right tools the right networks um, and, and just keep that dialogue going because um, through that dialogue you will you will uncover the problems um, that, that are, are in your organization or your team or your project. Great. Thanks, uh, Eloise. Jules, uh, have you seen any uh, perceptible change in, in focus on employee welfare, particularly fatigue? Yeah, I, th I think it's been, you know, all the any good company has been focused on this. And, you know, from a personal point of view for BCG, we've taken the opportunity to completely revamp our well-being strategy and I think it, it, the important it, even more tangible will be when people do return to the office the expectation is completely different because um, whilst working from home um, can be um, monotonous it also has enabled some people to have a greater balance so um, we wouldn't be unique in any in amongst organizations in retaining a greater element of that for our whole workforce um, and that drives right back to the issues that Sharon was talking about in terms of you know what that means for occupancy etc in buildings um i think it's a it's a path of discovery isn't it and it's it's learning to live with uncertainty and we don't know what's going to happen next there was is there a new variant on the way and actually we won't be able to take the one-way path back out to the pub and our favorite festival um so we all have to be really agile and and deal with that uncertainty keep listening to the employees um start, you know, our colleagues team members and and put in place things that, that work for them I haven't seen any, I, I can't think of a risk situation where, you know, fatigue has been cited, for example. That would be interesting to keep an eye on that in the future. Um, but it's just there in the background as an important priority for any uh, management team and a leadership team in an organisation. That's great. Thanks, Jules. And uh, we've got time probably for one more question, which uh, if I go around each of the panel, um, what uh, ESG metrics, in your view, are proving most challenging to measure? Uh, Graham, are you able to uh, let's have your thoughts on that first of all? Um, I think where where um, NHBC is certainly involved is um, in um, material usage and 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 the environmental element of uh, sustainability. Um, and that um, there is a challenge there in um, moving specification and delivery um, and the costs associated potentially with that. I, I've seen some recent uh, articles um, talking about the, the impact of the costs of, um, of, of delivering, particularly to the sustainability measures. Um, we're, we keep very close to the, that, that, that whole um, sustainability zero um, climate um, agenda. Um, it's something which we support, obviously, um, for the long term, um, uh, because that, as long as that, that moves alongside long term building quality and, um, um, and durability as well, um, and getting that right balance. Okay, thanks, uh, Graham. Sharon? So one of the challenges of working from home is the doorbell goes, isn't it? And that's a risk always. Um, I think one of the, there's a couple of difficult um, metrics, really. So one of them obviously being the social metric. I mean, how do you measure it? How do you measure your social impact? I mean, is there a recognised metric? I know um, organisations like the UK GBC are looking at social value and how do you calculate it? So that really is a, a, always a challenge. Um, in terms of the environment, I suppose the hardest challenge is around um, actually measuring the carbon and capturing the carbon emissions, particularly where you have FRA releases, because obviously then you're relying very much on stakeholder engagement um, and encouraging those people to, uh, to, to engage in the whole process of ESG. So I think if I was to say that they're the, they're the two main ones, because governance you have much more of control over because it's what you do. Um, so the, for me, those would be the two challenges. That's great. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, before I come to Jules, Eloise. Embodied carbon is an interesting one, actually. And I know there's lots of uh, research um, going on in, in the industry and lots of different measures at the moment around 
embody carbon and obviously as a as a as an organization that does a lot of new build housing um it, it, you know we, we we can say that we can be net zero carbon by way of the operation of those new new houses going forwards from from 2030 that's that's the statement that we put out there but it's it's the embodied carbon bit which is a really interesting how far do you go you know what is the the scope of that bubble that you're you're measuring if you like um and the the different measures and different metrics that are flying around in industry you know which one do we choose to to suit us as an organization and going back to Sharon's point social value has always been a difficult one to measure um and it's that's that's the change that you and the impact you have on an area as a result of what you're you're doing so those for me are the are the the two difficult ones I think uh, for, for us as an organization at the moment. Great thanks Eloise. Uh, Jules? Yeah I, I completely agree with the, the comments just made it's uh, embodied carbon and that whole supply chain you, you how big is the, the the envelope that you're you're measuring and I think social value as well Sharon's spot on it's you know how do you get to a consistent way of measuring it that everybody can sign up for there are methodologies out there and we advise on those methodologies but I think both social value and ESG just to finish on a on a last point are both an alphabet soup of different acronyms and methodologies at the moment where everybody's racing to try and establish what the benchmark is and um, we do need to get there um, otherwise we'll be talking about different things in slightly different ways and, and that's one of the fundamental challenges for ESG as it becomes a sort of mainstay about that's how we talk about our corporate um, lives and our corporate performance. That's great. Thank you, Jules. Our time is up, I think. Thanks, everyone, for contributing your questions and also for, for listening in what I hope you'll think has been quite uh, an insightful hour with a lot of key topics and themes, some uh, very, very topical and very much high at the agenda of the, uh, the organisations of the panel members. Mm-hmm.